I'm going to give you a very quick uh, uh, overview of MENA's background because you don't have this in your programs. MENA joined the Foreign Office in 1989. She served in a wide range of diplomatic roles. Um, she most recently was a member of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office Management Board as HR Director. She's had postings in Washington DC, in Ghana, Israel, Kenya and Brussels. Of course, loves Australia the most. I just made that up, but she's nodding. She has served as Private Secretary to the Permanent Under Secretary as well as the Press Office and the Africa and EU, uh, EU directories. And we are very honoured to have her as part of the 5050 by 2030 Foundation's Advisory Council. Will you please welcome Her Excellency, Mina Rawlings. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Uh, we're just sorting out our slides, so bear with us. And while we're doing that, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past, uh, present, and emerging. Oh, yes, here we go. Excellent, great. So um, I'm going to speak probably for about 15 minutes, um, and then I'd love to uh, have a bit of a conversation with you all, if I can. Um, and although the title of my keynote is indeed 20 plus years down the road, examining the journey towards gender equality and what needs to be accomplished to create lasting change, uh, I've got a slightly shorter title, which is Women in Diplomacy, Look How Far We've Come. Um, but before I get into that, I just wanted to share uh, with you a little bit about my week, because I think you know, one of the risks of having people like me coming and talk about our journey is that we're not quite honest enough and uh, we don't actually share some of the real challenges and issues that all of us face as we step into leadership roles. So, yes, I do have the best job ever as British High Commissioner to Australia. I've been here for just over three years uh, and it is absolutely wonderful. I have some wonderful female colleagues, including Uni, who are going to hear from next. Um, but I also uh, have another job, which is as a mum uh, and uh, uh, as, as a wife, a wife and a mother. Um, never mind a friend and a colleague and all those other things uh, we, we take on in our lives. Uh, I have three kids aged uh, 20, 17 and 11. Um, and I was reflecting when I was thinking about what to say today. Just, I mean, I just had one of those weeks. I'm sure we all have. It's just been complete chaos, basically. So um, it's been very busy. Um, I'm still suffering a bit from jet lag from a trip to the UK. Uh, and my kids have just all been in various stages of meltdown the whole week. So um, on Tuesday, for example, I had, a, I had a particularly busy day. I was hosting a lunch at the residence, also at home. Uh, hosting a dinner at the residence, you know, back-to-back -back meetings at work, and uh, it was, yeah, it was chaos. So my 17-year-old uh, daughter got a new mouse at the weekend, a male mouse. Don't do it, they stink. <laughs> we already have two female mice, they are very well behaved and not smelly. Anyway, she got a male mouse, called it Ronaldo, um, and it escaped on Tuesday morning, so that was the start of my day. Uh, my 11-year-old son was in complete meltdown over his homework, and why I wasn't there to help him again that evening, why did I have to go out? Uh, I fled to the hairdressers to get my roots done, because as many women of my age will know, this is a really important part of just you know, getting through your life, is getting your roots done. Um, and then I had a text from my eldest daughter, who was in London, trying to get to, the, uh, to Heathrow Airport to fly over to see us. Uh, she was stuck on a train, you know, what am I meant to do in the hairdressers getting my roots done, I don't know. Um, and then, and I will share this with you, please don't put this on social media or tweet it, as I was paying at the hairdresser, somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, excuse me, uh, your skirt is tucked into your knickers. <laughs> so that was my Tuesday. And I, I share all this because I just want everybody to know that, you know, you can be British High Commissioner and still be a real person. And all of us are real people with real lives and uh, therefore we need to support each other and recognize that there is no such thing as a superwoman. And I think the more we can be honest about that, the more we can support each other, lean in, uh, as the famous phrase goes, and keep getting women up uh, all of our organizations. Um, so, to get back to my script, look how far we've come. There is a link, I'll come back to it. Um, so look how far we've come. Um, I have given this talk or something like it a bit before, so apologies if any of you are hearing this 
for the second time, but um, I got this title from walking to school with my son Joe when he was about eight, and we were in the UK, and I was late, more chaos, uh, and I was running up a hill with him on the way to school, and I was saying, come on Joe, you know, keep up. And he said, he was looking back down the hill, and he said, but mum, look how far we've come. And I think about our journey uh, on gender equality in exactly that way. I mean, as Virginia says, of course we still have so much to do. And I think we're absolutely right to be challenging ourselves on, you know, why are we stuck at 30%? You know, why haven't we gone further? But I think it's also worth just pausing and remembering the journey that we've all been through and people like me have been through over the last uh, 20 years or so. So I'm going to try this. There we go. So, um, uh, as you've heard, I've worked for the Foreign Office for many years. 20 plus years is very generous. It's actually 28 and a half, but you know, time passes quickly. Um, and when I joined the Foreign Office in 1989, it was a very different organisation from what it was today. Um, and it was the sort of stereotypical, I suppose, foreign service. Um, it was very elite in terms of the talent that it drew on. Um, it was it was full of. Um, without being pejorative in any way, it was full of tall, thin, clever men, most of whom had been to private schools and had studied at Oxford or Cambridge. Um, when I joined, there were only two female ambassadors, British ambassadors, anywhere in the world. And a lot of that was to do with the marriage bar, which I know existed in DFAT as well, whereby if you're a woman and you got married, you had to leave because you couldn't possibly um, sort of square that circle around being a wife, never mind a mother. Um, and being a diplomat. So when I looked up the organisation, you know, there was literally nobody who looked like me and the couple of women that had made it had made a hell of a lot of sacrifices to do that. Uh, we only had one female ambassador at that point uh, with kids and she'd only been posted two years before. So you know, it was a very alienating organisation to be honest when I joined. Um, I think in broader diversity terms as well, it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. Um, and we had a bar on homosexuality until 1992. Uh, so, which is you know, during the course of my career. Amazing when we think about that now, just, just incredible. Um, and we have made progress, but you, know, you can see you know, Virginia's challenge, we are at that sort of 30% mark. So 33% uh, of our senior management are women. Um, we have 57 uh, ambassadors who are female which you know, is just much, much better. And the curve on that is quite sharp. We are moving quite quickly on that. So we've, you know, we've more than doubled uh, in the last 10 years. Um, and we have a target, and I'll come back to the targets in a sec, but um, we, have 39, we have a target for 39% of women in senior management roles by 2019. So you know, we're on our way with more to do. And I think in thinking about you know, where do we go from here and how can we keep getting better, it's important to recognize the success factors in getting us to the 30% uh, level. So um, for me, these are uh, my sort of top five. Um, I think the first one is leadership, you know, relentless leadership from the top, setting the tone from the top on the importance of diversity and inclusion. The second is advocacy, the importance of having people like you, you know, people in the system who are joining women's networks or LGBTQI networks or what we call BAME networks in the UK, black and minority ethnic staff networks, and really pushing, pushing all the time for more, um, you know, demanding more than the organization can demand for itself. That's incredibly important. The culture, breaking down some of the hierarchical culture that exists in many public sector organizations still today. And I've seen this in both Australia and the UK. And challenging ourselves as leaders on what we can do uh, to keep breaking down those barriers. HR, I'm a former HR director at the Foreign Office, so I'm passionate about this one. But what are our policies that support women? Uh, particularly, I think, in those sort of years of the child, you know, the childbearing years for many of us, when uh, men uh, are often sort of forging ahead on their career, uh, and we have, you know, many other pressing priorities. Um, part of that, I think, is sharing the burden or the joy of parenthood more with our spouses, and I'll, again, I'll touch on that uh, in a moment. Um, but I think, you know, how good are our HR policies when it comes to supporting women when they're out of the workplace and then getting them back in and recognizing the skills and the abilities that we all develop from multitasking in the way that I uh, described earlier on. What does that say about us as being able to uh, perform our jobs? 
Uh, what do we do about job shares, flexible working? How do we support different models of work? How do we support remote workers? Those sorts of policies need to be at the centre of HR in public sector organisations. And then finally, targets. As I said, you know, we can have the quotas targets debate. We almost always do. Um, but you know, for me, targets are an absolute bare minimum because what gets measured gets done. And boards love targets. Give boards a target and they'll strive towards it. Um, so that's, uh, I think, how we've got to where we are and how we can keep going further. Um, I wanted to say, though, a bit about my own um, journey, uh, just sort of going back to that point about how it felt to join an organization like that and the effect that had on me. And as I said, you know, it felt, it felt like a very strange place. Um, I didn't feel as if I'd fitted in for many years. And I think that can affect our confidence, and it definitely affected mine. Um, and you know, now we have a, a name for it, we call it imposter syndrome, so we can all say, yes, I've got imposter syndrome. But you know, I had imposter syndrome before there was a name for imposter syndrome. Uh, and all I knew is that I felt very, very nervous. Uh, I found it very hard to find my voice. You know, even in small meetings, I found it very, very hard to speak out. And I think it took me a long time to realize that that was what was going on. And I think what we see increasingly uh, and acknowledge is that you know, a lot of people feel like that. It isn't always women, it tends to be women. Also, people from other underrepresented groups also can have a very hefty dose of imposter syndrome. And I think you know, we talk, uh, we're starting to talk more about a really important issue, which is the intersection between you know, different underrepresented groups. So uh, an Asian woman said to me, you know, as an Asian female, it's the double whammy. Uh, and I think you know, we shouldn't just think about gender, we need to think about diversity more broadly and how we work across those uh, different characteristics to support people. Um, and I think people still feel like this. You know, I thought, well, maybe this was just me, maybe this is all gone and people don't feel like that anymore. But um, just a few years ago, only about three years ago, uh, there was a colleague, an Asian female, Nandip Sahota, and we had a blog debate going about these issues, and she said, you know, she still remembered her first week in the Foreign Office and walking up the grand staircase with a feeling of pride and awe. And she said, you know, overwhelmingly, I felt out of place. I know many colleagues shared similar feelings. No one sounded like me. Uh, this grand building made me feel even tinier. Um, she said that she'd gone on to deal with that and she now recognized that there's no such thing as a typical diplomat. We all represent modern Britain and that she felt more assured and felt that she belonged. And you know, I thought, well, that took her about two years. That took me about 20 years. So you know, hopefully we are supporting people more in accelerating their own journey uh, through confidence uh, and being able to you know, recognize their own value through their own difference. Um, so how have I sort of approached this journey? Uh, so I've got a little model for this that I use, and it's based on my favorite place to go on holiday, outside of Australia, obviously, which is Corfu, which is a beautiful island off the coast of Greece. Um, and the reason I use that is uh, for these reasons. Here we go. So first of all, confidence. You know, I've talked about it a lot already. Um, and I think, you know, in my case, it was... It sort of lack of confidence stemmed from some good things actually, which was you know, self-awareness, a bit of perfectionism, uh, and my own sense of difference, and those things can hold us back. But you know, my learning is that we can't let them hold us back, and we need to acknowledge it and support each other in moving forward. And I was very happy when Prince Harry a couple of years ago said that he was afraid of public speaking, and I thought, well, you know, if you've got Prince Harry saying that, it's perfectly fine for the rest of us to be honest about some of the struggles that we have. And I think you have to take responsibility as well. So, you know, get a coach or mentor, develop a peer group with your female colleagues as we have uh, in the female head of mission community. Um, you know, get some strategies to help you overcome your own difficulties. So, you know, people say well, to me, what did you do? Well, I learned some breathing techniques. I stopped beating myself up quite so much and I pushed my comfort zone. So, you know, 15 years ago or even 10 years ago, there's no way I would have stood here talking to all of you without being really trembly and very shaky. So, you know, we can learn and develop and we can move on. Uh, o is for opportunity. So, I'm very opportunity driven um, and I think being open to different opportunities, be that maybe not quite that job that you were thinking of, but one that sparks a bit of interest in you. Um, you know, take chances in the jobs that you do. 
Uh, if, if you feel it's something aligns with your values and your motivations, be open-minded, I think. Take learning opportunities whenever they arise. You know, be the one to put your hand up and say, yeah, I'll do that, I'll have a go. I think that, that can give you immense sort of strength and power and help to develop your networks within what highly networked organisations. R is for resilience. Um, I think this one you know, is a matter of time. And I think it's about leveraging all those setbacks and difficulties we all have in the workplace or in our home, in our personal lives, and using those to realize that we can overcome difficulty. We do have a real you know, depth of resilience, each of us, and sort of building on that to um, keep moving forward and to learn how to bounce back from failure as well as to celebrate success. The F is for um, family and friends. Um, so, you know, at this point, I do like to acknowledge uh, my husband, Mark, um, who has taken on the role of primary carer in our house for those three kids. I don't know where he was on Tuesday, by the way, but, <laughs> but in general, you know, he has taken on that role, and you know, that day is something that he does uh, many days of the week. So for me, there's, you know, there's a big question relating to how do we go further about the role of men in our society. It's great to see a couple of guys here today, and just to think about you know, how can we make it okay for more men to be the ones that stay at home and look after the kids? You know, how can we sort of keep pushing for societal change that enables that to happen? Um, and for me, you know, I absolutely would not be here without that support. And, you know, how we uh, work with our partners to enable our own success, I think, is something to keep thinking about. And then, of course, you know, family is incredibly important to me. So. How do we draw the red lines, the boundaries? How do we bound our work in an age of social media and 24-7 working so that we're not working all the time? Um, and my approach here has been to insist from day one that I don't work at weekends unless it's absolutely business critical. And I have one free evening a week. That doesn't sound like much, but believe me, it's been an absolute lifesaver. So, you know, think about boundaries and how we draw them for ourselves. And friends, gosh, we just all need friends. And the more senior we get, I think the more, the more we need those true friends who've known us for years, you can uh, tell us how it is and aren't sort of, aren't um, fooled by the Her Excellency sort of title, you know, know you how, you how you really are. And then the you is, it's all about you. And I am quite passionate about authentic leadership. Um, and obviously, you know, authenticity is a big word at the moment. And in political leadership, people are looking for authenticity. So, you know, that makes it absolutely fine for all of us to lead as we are. Um, you know, we don't, need, we don't need to conform to a certain role model of, or a certain type of leadership. It's for us to define our own way of leading and our own way of being within quite complex organizations. Um, I'm going to stop in a sec. I'm just going to finish with one more quote, which is actually from a guy. Um, he's a, um, a uh, male black uh, FCO colleague, foreign office colleague. And he wrote in another blog uh, these words, which I really liked. He said that the imposter syndrome cannot only be reconciled, but also used to one's advantage. Your difference, your ability to draw upon multiple identities and experiences helps you excel in promoting British interests through a unique understanding of other peoples and cultures. In other words, don't be afraid to be yourself. So, when we think about 20 years down the road, examining the journey towards gender equality and what it's to be accomplished to create lasting change, or, as Joe would put it, uh, my son, mum, look how far we've come. You know, I feel privileged to have lived through a time of immense change for women, which means we can make a big contribution because of, not despite our gender, our authenticity, and our difference. Sorry, I get emotional at this point, <laughs> always. Um, and if I can do it, you can do it. Thank you very much. see everyone manly taking notes there and uh, for a late arrival there is actually a chair just up here at this table I think it's our very last seat but you're most welcome to take it I could see people out there's a couple of chairs at the front actually uh, as well I could see manly taking notes and for good reason there was so much material in that and there's so many things I would love to talk to you about 
But I'm going to throw open two questions from the floor because I'm sure many of you do have questions. And uh, I think Pia will be running around with a microphone um, if she has one. Or pop your hand up and a microphone will come to you. But I have a question, Mena, that I want to ask you straight away because <laughs> apart from your honesty there, and I, the, the, the image of the the skirt in the knickers, just, I'm never going to, I'm never going to forget that, but, um, and I did, I wanted to say, I want to say to David Morrison, then I bet that never happens to you, but uh, it's, it's a bit of a girl thing, but it's, it has happened to me too, but your honesty about being a real person is so important because women tend, particularly women in senior roles, such as yourself, tend not to do that and, and tend to try and give the appearance all the time that everything is, is, is honky-dory. You, you spoke about one of the things that struck me, well, many things struck me, but when you spoke about chance, take a chance, and, you, and confidence, I'm looking at you and I'm thinking, did you ever really grapple with confidence? I, I mean, it's hard to imagine. And I know you said you took breathing exercises and, and worked at it, but can you tell us a little bit about that confidence issue? I mean, how did you even get into the, into the foreign office if you were grappling with a confidence issue? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, absolutely, uh, I did. Um, and I think, you know, I think it, it fundamentally um, does stem from a, uh, a desire to be really good at what I do, if that doesn't sound weird. So I think, um, you know, on the one hand, you know, I really wanted to succeed. Um, I'm incredibly competitive, by the way. And I think that got me a long way when I didn't have much confidence. I still wanted to be the best or, you know, win the competition or be better than the guys. Um, but I think the thing that, that, that sort of that was the shadow of that, and I think, you know, we talk in leadership terms of our strengths and our shadow. I think my shadow was that I was also a deep perfectionist and I was very, very self-critical. So, you know, I always thought, I'd come out of a meeting thinking, God, all those guys, you know, they all said really clever things, and I said something really dumb, and why did I say that? Um, you know, or um, I wrote, I wrote a, 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 a telegram about a political issue, and, you know, it was okay, but well, I've just read one from somebody else, and it was much better. So I think, you know, that voice, that sort of gremlin in your ear, I think really held me back. And then you combine that with that sense of difference, um, and, you know, looking around you and thinking, well, gosh, you know, I don't really fit in here. You know, I, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit sort of strange within this organisation. I think that just compounded it. Um, and, you know, I think these days, you know, I probably would have been diagnosed, diagnosed with anxiety. <laughs> but, you know, I was in my 20s, just really struggling, just in meetings, just as I said, really just to find my voice. Um, and if we had longer, you know, I could talk more about how I sort of got through that. Um, but one of the key breakthrough moments, I'll just tell you, was um, I did a leadership course and for the first time we were videoed and the video was played back. And I watched myself on video and I thought, oh my God, I sound coherent. I look like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and in my head, I, you know, I was thinking this is really rubbish and I'm saying all the wrong things. But the person that I saw was like really um, quite convincing. And that was a massive switch yeah. moment for me yeah. when I realized what was in my head wasn't what I was projecting and that therefore I could deal with those things and trust that outwardly I looked like I was a competent human being. <laughs> it's a beautiful image. But yeah, trust. Trusting yourself and backing yourself. Do we have some questions? Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but we'll take one from just here. And um, Meta will be here during morning tea, will you? I will. Okay, so if you want to grab her during morning tea. Your question? Um, hello. Um, I think it was Annabelle Crabb, the uh, journalist, who said that um, in order to um, be successful um, that you have to work like you don't have children and, <laughs> and be a mother like you don't work. Um, do you think that that is a true assessment and um, how did you bridge that? Well, great question. I love Annabelle Crabb, by the way. She's awesome. Um, uh, I think that's true up to a point, and I mean, I think, I mean, I don't know what she means, but what I would mean by that, I'd love to know what Uni thinks as well, um, who also has three kids, um, is, you know, I think you need to be in the moment, and I think to deal with these very different sort of um, roles, the key thing for me is, is when you're in that moment, you are that person. 
Um, so, you know, when you're at work, I am at work, and, you know, I do give it absolutely 100%, you know, until you get that text or whatever which sort of disrupts, and you need to be able to switch quite quickly. And then when I'm at home, I'm absolutely try to be a mum. I think the reason a High Commissioner role or an ambassadorial role is very challenging is because it throws those two things together. You know, you don't have that separation, so you're in you know, those places where I'm hosting those incredibly important people for lunch or dinner are also the place where my daughter's upstairs screaming, where's my mouse, Ronaldo? <laughs> you know, so, uh, and I find that challenging. I, I think, you know, that's probably the hardest thing in a personal way that I find about being ambassador. I prefer a bit more of a separation. Um, and with the way of work these days, also it's harder, you know, you leave the office, you don't actually really leave your Blackberry or your iPhone or whatever. Um, so I think we have to use that to our advantage. But all the same, you know, fundamentally, be in the present, work, mum, you can give 100% to each when you're in that moment. Can I just add a question to that though? Aren't we, isn't the, the onus really on all of us to break down that very thing that, that you're asking about? By doing what you just did, by it, which is being honest about your life, your messy week, your kids, the disruption, coming back to the knickers, but being honest about it and saying, you know, no, I, it, it's, 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 it's pretend to suggest that everything's smooth sailing. Absolutely, and that's why, that's why I did it, even though that's slightly scary. Um, because I think, you know, I've, I've seen very senior, amazing women speak. Um, I think it's particularly hard for politicians, you know, to really open up. Um, I remember we heard from uh, Julie Bishop once at, at an event, a, a female event, you know, and she's, she's amazing and she's a great speaker. But I put my hand up and asked her about resilience, you know, how does she do it? Because that's what I'm really interested in, to be honest you know, looking still to improve and grow. How does she do, yeah. it? How does she do it? So I think we need to bust that open more and talk more honestly and be more honest about what that means in terms of the support that we all need to keep breaking through. And if we don't have those conversations, we won't get to 50%. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank Melanie Williams. Thank you so much.